Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon all of you. My name is Amjad Mahmood Khan. I volunteer as National Director of Public Affairs for the Amdi Muslim Community, also teach and practice law in Los Angeles. A thousand people attending this amazing conference, uh, 71 different convening organizations, 31 faith communities represented. Uh, we're really delighted to be a part of it. Um, this particular event that we're convening is rather timely, um, and it concerns a matter of, of particular uh, uh, urgency. And uh, the timing of this, uh, we feel, couldn't be better in terms of uh, shining a spotlight on Pakistan's blasphemy laws and their uh, reach in the digital space. Uh, yesterday, I spoke at the plenary session some of you were there and may have heard those remarks in which I pointed out um, a legal structure of discrimination uh, that's particularly dire, and that is the use of telecommunications to, and cyber laws to essentially criminalize blasphemy. And what I mean by that particularly is uh, there are new regulations in Pakistan pursuant to uh, revisions to the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act uh, that permit Pakistan's equivalent of the FCC, the Pakistan Telecommunication Authority, to uh, bring notice against foreign operators of websites that they deem to be blasphemous uh, of Islam. For Ahmadis in particular, this is uh, problematic, to say the least, because, of course, there are two of the five blasphemy laws that are anti ahmadi laws, that criminalize Ahmadi activities for indirectly or directly posing as a Muslim. And so the mere fact of any act of an Ahmadi is uh, an arrestable offense domestically, of course, in Pakistan. And you know, since 1984, there have been thousands of prosecutions of Ahmadis. There are uh, many Ahmadis who are languishing in prison, 11 particular prisoners of conscience now. And uh, these blasphemy laws have been used in a variety of ways to cause a lot of, of true uh, persecution that the community faces in Pakistan for the estimated over one million Ahmadis there. However, um, it wasn't understood that these uh, laws can also extend outside the borders of Pakistan. And what we've seen since the beginning of, uh, since the beginning of December, the middle of December, is a renewed interest in trying to extend these laws abroad and then specifically targeting foreign operators of Ahmadi websites. So to date, 20 Ahmadi websites have been issued formal notices of prosecution and orders. Uh, the, the first one was one that I know very well because I received it myself. And it was December 24th in which an email was sent uh, to myself and uh, another colleague who's here, a national spokesperson, Hadis Zafar, in which it said specifically that the website trueislam.com, the official website of the U.S. community, which has nothing to do with Pakistan, um, should uh, be uh, discontinued and removed, and if not complied with in 24 hours, there would be a, uh, a court order and a, a potential for a 500 million rupee fine and of course uh, prosecution under the various blasphemy provisions which can range from three to 10 years of prison sentences depending on the nature of the application. So of course that wasn't the most, um, that wasn't the nicest notice to receive uh, on December 24th, but nevertheless we received it, alarmed by it, and uh, there was no uh, limitation on it. It was truly an extraterritorial breach. It was section 37.1 of PICA. Today, we are going to be doing a deeper dive as to what this means, because we're talking about citizens in Australia, citizens in the UK, citizens in Germany, citizens in Canada, American citizens, as I mentioned, who are now being implicated in what can effectively become foreign criminal, criminal proceedings with foreign reach. And uh, this has wide implications for uh, individuals outside of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. This is, of course, uh, very concerning to the Christian community, who are the subject of blasphemy prosecutions, to the Sunni community and the Shia community, who are the subject of blasphemy prosecutions. And so all U.S. citizens should wonder about the extraterritoriality of this particular law and what is the, where is this headed? 
So with that, uh, we have an amazing uh, panel uh, that we'll hear from and a few speeches. So I'll begin with um, uh, the, the current chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, Nadine Maenza. Uh, Nadine has been an amazing advocate for religious freedom, an expert, really, for two decades. Uh, she has been working formally in this position uh, for a few years. Um, she was reappointed uh, last year by the White House to a second two-year term and now she's the chair of the commission. Um, she has done tremendous work representing USURF and delegations all over the world, particularly in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Myanmar, Bahrain, Indonesia, Iraq, and there's a whole host of countries. I don't know when she's even here. She's advocating so much. On a personal note, I follow her Twitter account and she's an amazingly um, passionate and effective advocate for so many communities, particularly the Yazidi community, which I've taken note of. So uh, with that, I'll invite Nadine to kick us off with some formal remarks. Thank you so much. That was um, very kind. And, um, and thank you, too, for the invitation um, to be here today. I'm honored just to be here, um, but also saddened that I need to be here to talk about the worsening conditions for Ahmadiyya Muslims in Pakistan. As many of you know, Yusuf was created in 1998 by the International Religious Freedom Act, or IRFA, and we make policy recommendations to the President, the Secretary of State, and to Congress. We're a little different um, than most government agencies um, in that we're independent and we're um, single fo focused on religious freedom. So we don't take into account bilateral relationships with the country. We speak only to specific religious freedom conditions. We cover about 30 countries that violate religious freedom around the world. Our annual report um, is an important part of our work and we um, make recommendations to the State Department for countries of particular concern or CPC and, all the, and also special watch list countries. And we're looking at those CPCs in particular this, that, that meet the definition of systematic, ongoing, and egregious violations of religious freedom. The key findings we use to make that decision um, comes from um, the insights we've gained from our travel, from our hearings, from fact-finding trips, um, research, meeting with government officials, meeting with groups such as yours, um, and um, religious leaders. Um, this year, USURF has recommended in its 2021 annual report that the State Department again designate Pakistan as a country of particular concern. Some of the key concerns that led to this recommendation include Pakistan's blasphemy and anti ahmadiyya laws that are used in conjunction with new media laws to persecute religious minorities, particularly the already vulnerable Ahmadiyya Muslim community. We are increasingly concerned about the Pakistan Telecommunication Authority enforcement of these laws against religious minorities, which we know directly impact people in your community, including here in the United States. The Ahmadiyya community in Pakistan continues to face constant and severe official and societal persecution for their beliefs and self-identification as Muslims. In 2020, the community witnessed a surge in targeted killings, hate crimes, hate speech, desecration of houses of worship, and grave, graves as well, and restrictions on the practice of their faith both in private and online. In our 2021 annual report, we made several recommendations on how the U.S. government and Congress can work to promote religious freedom and assist with the protection of religious minorities in Pakistan. First, we recommend that members of Congress advocate for the release of blasphemy prisoners, such as Ramzan Bibi and other individuals in prison for their religion or belief. We also urge the administration to work with the Pakistani government to encourage substantial steps to address religious freedom violations, including the repeal of blasphemy and anti ahmadiyya laws. Until a repeal is accomplished, the United States should encourage Pakistan to enact reforms to make, to make blasphemy bailable, requiring evidence by accusers, in ensure proper investigation by senior police officials, allow authorities to dismiss unfounded accusations, and enforce existing penal code articles criminalizing perjury and false accusations. USURF also recommends, recognizes that disinformation and hate speech is often used to further persecute the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Pakistan. We ask the U.S. government to press the Pakistani government to cease extremist rhetoric that often leads to the targeting of Ahmadiyya Muslims and their houses of worship. We also ask that the United States government encourage Pakistan to hold accountable individuals, including government officials, who incite or participate in communal violence, 
We also urge the United States to press the Pakistani government to reform its public school textbooks, curriculum, teacher training materials to ensure content is inclusive and not discriminatory towards any religious minorities. You can rest assured that USURF will continue to unflinchingly raise concerns impacting your community in Pakistan and do whatever we can to press the government to take action. So thank you again for having me here today and I'm looking forward to further conversation. Thank you, Nadine, and thank you for, thank the commission for um, your annual report, which we read and which is used by advocates, and we appreciate your ongoing examination of these issues. We would now like to play a video um, of remarks from Sir Iftikhar Ayaz. Sir Iftikhar Ayaz is the chairperson of the International Human Rights Committee, which is an NGO that's been advocating for all religious communities, particularly focused on the Ahmadiyya Muslim community's persecution. Iftikhar Ayaz um, is a distinguished diplomat in the UK with an incredible career. He's been advocating uh, for religious freedom for a good part of five decades, probably longer. Um, he, uh, we're very uh, happy that he was able to present his remarks, which we'll play by a video. We wanted to have him here in person, but uh, we weren't able to due to the COVID restrictions. But I ask our technical team to play that, play his remarks now. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Respected chairpersons, distinguished guests, friends, and fellow champions of peace and freedom, I extend to you my warm greetings and congratulations on a tremendously successful summit. The struggle for freedom, for equality, and for dignity by those in this room is a journey that spans generations. Tom Lentus, for example, our co-chair, Katrina Lentus's father, was a man of tremendous character who himself was a victim and survivor of severe religious and racial persecution. It was March 1944 when the German military invaded Hungary and occupied its capital, Budapest. At that time, a young, proud Jewish boy, Tom Lentos, who was just 16 years old, was arrested by the Nazis. He was sent to a forced labor camp to suffer toil and torture. He escaped, finding safety in a safe house set up by a wonderful and determined Swedish diplomat whose name was Raoul Wellenberg. I begin with this story because it is real and it is compelling. It is also because each one of you is a potential Raoul Wellenberg, of whom the persecuted need many, many more. Because despite the establishment of the United Nations in 1945, the need to protect human rights could not be more starker or more indispensable. In Pakistan, 47 years have passed since anti ahmadiyya laws in Pakistan legalized legalized the deprivation of political, social, economic, and cultural rights for Ahmadis. It is worsening. Not enough people know of it. Not enough people care about it. Not enough people are doing enough to stop it. The persecution has an official quality. It is direct product of government policy. The Pakistan government is unable or unwilling to protect Ahmadis from persecution. Indeed, it denies it. In its 2017 national report submitted to the United Nations Human Rights Council as part of the Universal Periodic Review, the Pakistan government did not make even a single mention of the persecution faced by Ahmadis. But 
its attempt to sweep its breaches of international law under the carpet failed and the UN Working Group on the Universal Periodic Review was unmoved. Instead, the Working Group specified a number of actions which the Pakistani government were asked to implement to rectify the persecution faced by Ahmadis. Not a single one of those recommendations, not a single one of those recommendations has been implemented as regards Ahmadis. 271 Ahmadis have been murdered in Pakistan because of their faith. In 2021 alone, Ahmadis have been murdered, died in custody, arrested, charged under anti ahmadiyya laws and been forced to leave their homes and jobs. Numerous mosques have been desecrated, gravestones have been destroyed and private properties defaced. And now a new wave of persecution has begun. The government is now banning the online existence of Ahmadis. Since November last year, the Pakistan Telecommunications Authority has begun to eliminate any access to possible online information about Ahmadis. It has issued notices to non-Pakistani organizations and people in the United States of America, United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada. Notices specifically reference blasphemy and anti ahmadiyya laws, even though they do not apply outside of Pakistan. 20 non-Pakistani websites hosted and managed in the West, including those with images of historical Ahmadi figures and humanitarian work are banned. In contrast, no action is taken in relation to extremist material encouraging the murder of families. In one online post, Ali Muhammad Khan, Pakistan's Minister of State for Parliamentary Affairs tweeted, there is only one punishment for blasphemy. He tweeted, there is only one punishment for blasphemy, beheading. Seven days later on national television, he said, we are willing to die to safeguard the honor of the Holy Prophet. Qadianis are a very big rebellion against Islam. No action was taken against him. No action is taken against others who call for hate and violence against Ahmadis. The official judgments of the Pakistan Telecommunications Authority claim extraterritorial jurisdiction. Their judgments make clear that the Pakistan government sees any right to religious freedom for Ahmadis, no matter how small, as blasphemy and a contravention of both the law and constitution of Pakistan. Now, if Pakistan regards anything happening anywhere in the world as coming within the jurisdiction of Pakistan, the PTA says that it has extraterritorial power. How wrong they are. They affect Western companies, Ahmadis and even refugees. The 1951 Refugees Convention and its 1967 protocol guarantee refugees protection, a core principle in that a refugee should not be returned to country where they face serious threats to their life or freedom. This is now being eroded by the Pakistani authorities. Ahmadis who fled persecution in Pakistan due to a serious threat of harm because of anti ahmadiyya laws and who have been granted international protection in the USA, Canada, Australia or the United Kingdom are now 
once again being targeted by the long tentacles of the Pakistani government. Those very individuals are now, according to the Pakistani government's regulatory body, subject to Pakistan's perceived extraterritorial jurisdiction. If previous notices are to be believed, they may even face fines of up to 500 million rupees. This is a direct assault on the established principles of international law. The international community must never stand quietly as the Pakistan state seeks to impose its laws on those who are outside its borders or who have been granted international protection in the, in the world. We must reject such attempts. We must not accede to it and we must resist it. The international legal system of human rights must function and it was intended to function and it should function as it was intended to function. We must encourage the United Nations and other international bodies to speak with a loud and determined voice against such breaches of international law, holding Pakistan to account for its long-standing failure to stop its abuses. For what is leadership? What is leadership if that leadership is not available at a time of crisis? The crisis is here. The crisis is here. Decades of persecution by the Pakistan authorities against Ahmadis and others necessitates a change in direction. Standing up for what is right is not a new world order. Neither is it an imposition of our own will. It is about the rule of law and universal freedoms. It is about ensuring that the law of the jungle does not govern the conduct of nations. It is about the protection of the innocent and the freedom which every man, woman, child must be entitled to enjoy no matter what their religion or faith. May God bless each and every one of us and give us the strength the courage and determination to challenge every affront to mankind and to secure peace and freedom for the persecuted. Thank you. Very powerful words from uh, Sharif Takhar Yaz um, as chairman of the International Human Rights Committee. The I should mention the secretary of that committee, Nassim Malik, has traveled from Sweden and has been here. I know some of you have met with him and has been working in this space. It's now my privilege to uh, introduce Mahmoud Ahmed. Uh, Mahmoud Ahmed is a member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. He's on the uh, national board of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyers Association and he will be conducting uh, up the panel of experts that we have assembled here. So, Mahmoud. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, as Amjad mentioned, the impetus for this event is to create awareness, facilitate dialogue, and inspire advocacy around these recent unprecedented actions by Pakistan's Telecommunications Authority, the PTA, to silence and prosecute U.S. citizens and other non-Pakistanis who are engaging in purported violations of Pakistan's notorious blasphemy and anti amity laws. And to that end, we've assembled an all-star panel, which I will now ask to come up to the stage and will be privileged to introduce in just a moment. Um, before I do so, I want to take a moment to set the stage for this discussion. Um, in November of 2020, the Pakistani government finalized its removal and blocking of unlawful online content rules 
2020, that's a mouthful, but that's what they're called, um, which sought to codify the PTA's authority to regulate content that the government deems unlawful. These rules not only enhance the PTA's ability to compel online content platforms such as Facebook, Google's, YouTube, Twitter, and Wikipedia to remove content, but also extended the regulator's purview to include local internet service providers that could also be held liable for such content. Then in mid-December, an army of trolls suddenly began uploading hundreds, if not thousands, of videos to YouTube and other platforms instructing um, other users to alter Google's search results related to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. This may have seemed like an isolated effort, were it not for the fact that a few weeks later, in late December, the PTA suddenly stepped into the arena and publicly used its newly granted authority for the first time to demand the removal of so-called sacrilegious content. The PTA cited unspecified public complaints against an unauthentic version, in their words, of the Quran uploaded by the Ahmadiyya Muslim community onto the Google Play Store, and information that portrayed Mirza Masur Ahmad, His Holiness, the supreme leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, as a Muslim on Wikipedia, which the PTA characterized as, quote, misleading, wrong, deceptive, and deceitful. As Amjad mentioned, on that same day, the PTA issued a legal notice to two Amadi U.S. citizens who are both sitting here in the audience, requiring them to remove their website, trueislam.com, or face fines, sanctions, and potential prison sentences. It's important to know that the True Islam website is a website designed and operated by Americans, directed at an American audience. And yet the PTA took it upon itself to reach out and try to take it down and threaten anyone involved with dire criminal consequences. Over the course of the past seven months, the PTA has issued additional notices, as Amjad mentioned, to other websites containing Ahmadi Muslim content and companies that help to host that content on the World Wide Web. And if the PTA notices were not bad enough on their own, the Pakistani courts, far from exercising any moderating influence, have decided to pour gasoline on this fire. A senior judge of the Punjab High Court summoned senior officials from the PTA, along with the FIA, which is Pakistan's premier law enforcement agency, and the Pakistani Attorney General, to a hearing. And at this hearing, the judge demanded to know why these assembled agencies were not doing more to bring criminal charges against overseas individuals and entities who were deemed to be in violation of Pakistan's blasphemy and anti amity laws. At this point, I'll paraphrase something Amjad said yesterday during the plenary session. The response to bad laws is to bring in good lawyers. And that's precisely what we did in this instance. And it's uh, my honor to introduce now uh, the lawyer and the legal team whom trueislam.com returned the service, retained the services of to assist with defending against these notices. Uh, Brett Williamson from O'Melveny and Myers joins us uh, by remote link. Uh, he wished uh, he could be here with us in person, but he had a conflicting commitment, so we were able to make it work through this wonderful new virtual world that we are able to take advantage of. Um, and um, Brett is a partner in O'Melveny and Myers, New York, and Newport Beach offices. He is one of the firm's most seasoned litigators with over 30 years of experience handling IP and technology litigation. Um, he has also maintained a robust pro bono practice for more than three decades um, and currently serves as O'Melveny's firm-wide partner in charge of pro bono and community legal services. And at this point, I will turn it over to Brett so that he can provide you with a bit more context and color for his team's advocacy. Brett, hopefully you can see and hear us. I, I can, and, and thank you, uh, Mahmoud. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, well, um, I, I do wish I could be with all of you in person and appreciate the opportunity to participate in the panel. Um, Jod did a, a quite a good job of, of um, recapping um, the um, 
the, the sort of the, the procedural history here. So I won't go in, into too much detail. And I think I'll just take a, a couple of moments to tell you what we've encountered uh, both procedurally and substantive in these enforcement actions by PTA and, and the theories that we've used. And I wish I could report that those arguments have, have resulted in successfully revoking these geofencing and, and, uh, and takedown orders. Uh, they have not done so yet, but we believe um, that the fight continues and, and um, we will continue to, to you know, make these arguments and, and advocate beyond the, the justice system as well um, until there's um, uh, some um, return, hopefully, to, to sanity uh, in this in enforcement regime. Um, the, as, as was mentioned before, PICA, um, while purporting to have a very wide reach, does also purport to have some limitations in its territorial jurisdiction. And in fact, in particular, PICA um, requires that the accused conduct, quote, affect a person, property, information system, or data located in, in Pakistan. Um, that, um, uh, that that serial listing um, of, of of requirements would lead, I think, one reasonably to believe that um, the hosting and administration uh, in the United States uh, of a website consisting of um, entire uh, of content entirely directed to uh, the uh, U.S. Com community, uh, sponsored by. Um, uh, the Ahmadi Muslim community would not be subject to enforcement. Um, of course, the reason that I'm here and involved is that that's not the position that the PTA has, has taken. Um, it's quite easy to see that if the theory of, um, of the territorial reach of PICA would include um, restricting access to a website that, um, again, has contents exclusively within the United States, and for that matter, any website that does not um, touch on um, Pakistan um, should be outside the reach of, of, um, of authority and would lead to what we believe and characterizes the absurd conclusion that the PTA has the power uh, to restrict uh, an effect and block any website anywhere in the world. Um, th there's also a second uh, jurisdictional and extraterritorial problem here. Um, and this also goes to the due process concerns that we have. And that is that the PICA requires some underlying uh, violation of Pakistan law in order to meet the definition of, um, you know, of its restrictive power. Um, and as we've pointed out multiple times, the failure of PTA to actually define uh, in any sort of specifics the uh, allegedly prohibited conduct makes it impossible for, um, uh, for the accused um, administrators to know, you know what's actually um, supposed to be restricted. Um, it, it, the argument we've made, of course, is that it, it can only be assumed that what is being restricted and what's being enforced are Pakistan's uh, anti-blasphemy laws, um, that it is uh, simply an attempt to chill speech outside of Pakistan, to chill the ability of the uh, Ahmadi Muslim community to um, spread its message and to do its good work. Um, and uh, and is directly in violation of of Pakistan's own um, pur purported commitment um, to you know, international uh, conventions, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, there's an additional problem, uh, as was mentioned as well, because these notice letters uh, to uh, trueislam.com, as well as to uh, the uh, Ahmadi Muslim Youth Association's website, uh, mkausa.org, uh, which was also um, uh, subject to such a notice, um, purport to, uh, uh, to allege penal code violations, which put the administrators and those involved in the sites at risk of criminal prosecution, which can be a very real risk if any of the individuals choose to travel to Pakistan and visit family or otherwise. 
potentially subject themselves to imprisonment or worse. So um, th that's the, the work we've been advocating against. We've been trying to make these points legally through what I've, uh, I think, described uh, variously as, uh, as Orwellian and Kafkaesque, depending on what stage of the proceeding we've been involved with, with the authorities. Um, and, and we'll continue to, to work hard on these, uh, on these issues, but uh, it has been um, uh, a, a difficult uh, road so far to convince the authorities that they need to, um, to adhere to basic due process. Thank you so much, Brett. Um, let me now briefly introduce the rest of our panelists. Um, Kian Vestensen uh, joins us. He's a research analyst for technology and democracy um, and covers sub-Saharan Africa and Western Europe for Freedom on the Net, Freedom House's annual assessment of internet freedom. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Kian. Uh, uh, Knox Thames joins us. He's a visiting expert at the U.S. Institute for Peace with the Middle East and, and Religion and Inclusive Societies teams. Um, he joined USIP after 20 years of government service, including at the United States uh, Department of State and two different government foreign policy commissions. Uh, and finally, we're honored to welcome Dr. Varis Hussain, who is an adjunct professor at the Howard University School of Law uh, and was previously a pol house policy analyst at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, of which obviously you heard from the current chair. Um, let me uh, open it up to the panelists and start with a question. Um, the internet has been heralded as a great engine of freedom in the world. And yet countries such as Pakistan are now deploying their repressive laws outside their own borders by virtue of the World Wide Web. What does this mean for digital rights and religious freedom in the years ahead? Kian, would you like to start? Fantastic. Um, well, uh, I'll start by uh, thanking you all for, for being here and, and for having me uh, at this fantastic summit. Better. Excellent. Um, as I said, or as Mahmoud introduced me, uh, I'm a researcher for Freedom House, uh, where I cover um, our Freedom on the Net report, which tracks internet freedom around the world um, and human rights online more broadly. Um, and I'll start by saying we've observed over the past 10 years a consistent decline in human rights online across the world. Um, and Pakistan is, is one such country that has uh, represented that trend specifically. Now, um, uh, we've spoken a great deal about how the PTA has taken its efforts to restrict religious freedoms into the online sphere. And it's done so in an increasingly systemic way. The amendments to PICA that uh, we've discussed so far um, really systematize these anti-blasphemy laws uh, and the restrictions in the online sphere in a way that we don't see um, in, in many other countries around the world. Uh, if these amendments are passed, uh, and by uh, unfortunately all signs seem to point to them being passed, uh, Pakistan would be in the company of countries like China and Iran and how systemically it would take these uh, restrictions of, of religious minorities um, in their, their rights to express themselves and, and their religious beliefs online. Now, I certainly don't want to mischaracterize uh, uh, the fact that um, countries around the world enforce blasphemy laws um, on the online space uh, in blocking content, in arresting people who are uh, activists for their community, um, whether that's religious minorities um, or people who identify as, as atheists or, or non-believers. Um, from Turkey and the UAE, where uh, real, uh, secular and atheist content is, is often blocked from the internet, um, to countries like Nigeria and Indonesia and Malaysia, where people who belong to religious minority groups are often arrested for posting uh, their beliefs online on Facebook or on Twitter for simply expressing themselves. Uh, but these amendments to PICA and what we've seen with the, the transnational reach of, of these blocking orders against members of the Ahmadi community um, really puts Pakistan in new and in incredibly concerning territory when it comes to repressing religious freedom on the internet. Sure. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so I think I have like two uh, points to add to this, right? Um, let's take a second to think about this. In 2001, 2% of Pakistanis had access to the internet. In 2021, 50% of the population has access to the internet. That is a huge burst in a market. Now, there's good things and bad things with that, right? The good things are that more people have access to information, all of that's happening, and that's great. 
The bad thing is that social media companies, technology companies, see Pakistan as an emerging market. So when the government asks them, hey, take down uh, the Amity websites, then IBM might say, yeah, because we want access to that market. It's a growing market. It's huge. Look at what the, what's happened in the last 20 years. So I think what I would uh, caution is saying that, you know, uh, the speed and the proliferation of the access to internet has been good, but also has been challenging because the way in which the government can twist the arms of technology and social media companies has become much, much more advanced, right? And then the second, or yeah, the second out of third, three points that I would say is that let's imagine for a second, right, that the hate against the Amity community is a vehicle, it's a car, right? Up till now, or before the internet came into Pakistan, it was traveling on a country road. Right? So it traveled, it went throughout the country slowly, it impacted people, hate crimes occurred, people died. The internet has created a superhighway. So that information, the hate speech, the things that were happening before at a much slower rate, now have an ability to impact real life Amity communities in a much faster way. Right? So the frequency, um, the likelihood of violence from hate crimes has gone up because the vehicle of hate is traveling faster. It has a highway to travel on now, an information highway. And the third thing I think that's always important, uh, Mamu, that I would emphasize here is that in my study, uh, sort of doing comparative constitutional law, right, and looking at Pakistan's constitutional history, every new method, every new attempt at oppression is first tried out on the Amity community. Right? So that's the canary in the minefield, right? So, or mine shaft. We want to try it on them. They're the most vulnerable. Nobody will really care if we, and if we get away with it, oh, we can go after the human rights defenders. We can go after other religious minority communities. So what we see is with this PICA, with the PEMRA, with all of the enforcement of these digital laws, the Amity community is the first one up for slaughter, essentially, because they're trying to see how much they can get away with. And if they can get away with it with the Amity community, maybe they can get away with it with others. And we've seen this with citizenship laws, we've seen this with the voting rights of the community, we've seen this with uh, the ability to run in elections. Those are, have all been impacted by the Amity community on the Amity community first, and then uh, it gets expanded. So I think that what we're seeing in Pakistan is this uh, proliferation. Um, and the internet, we thought, I think, many of us in the human rights community, that you know, the internet will be a way that the vehicle of hate will be destroyed. Right? It'll go away. People will talk more with each other. There'll be more connections. Everybody will be Facebook friends with each other. But that's not what happened. What happened was that like bad actors got onto social media and said, oh, I can impact more than just my neighborhood or my town with a speech that's very inflammatory against the Amity community. I can actually go online and within 24 hours have a hundred or sorry, a million point two impressions of that tweet. So that means that people around the country have now seen me inflame violence against this community when before it would just be my own small community, right? So I think that that's what we've seen, which is both, you know, I think we thought that it would be good, but I think we're seeing the negative sides of it more as we go forward. Cyberspace is the next battle space and the wars over information, truth. We've already seen for years now the way the Pakistani government has tried to limit the free access of information, particularly from the Amity community, from other faith groups, uh, because they, they're at war against ideologies that run up against the particular notions of what uh, the country should be about, what the founding ideals are. We see this now expanding with the application of these laws that were passed in 1984, 1986, before the internet existed, before anyone had cell phones, before the you know computers were you know, the Macintosh had just been released, uh, there was no no way that there was any idea that they'd be applied in this way. But you know, Pakistan sadly uh, always finds new ways to be remarkably bad, um, and here is no exception, and they're sort of race to the bottom. Um, but I think also the way that these laws are being applied in an extraterritorial manner fits a larger pattern we're seeing globally, where you know human rights work is is changing. We've seen um, you know Russia murder people that are against Putin in the UK. We've seen China levy sanctions against Ambassador Brownback and Lord Alton. 
We've seen, you know, Belarus ground a plane that was flying through internet, its airspace to pull off a, a, a democracy advocate. Um, these are unprecedented times. And I think as all of us are concerned about human rights and religious freedom, we have to be thinking, how do we meet this challenge? We're in a, we're in a new day. This, the 21st century will present challenges that didn't exist in the 20th. The, of course, we'll continue to highlight abuses. Naming and shaming, I think, is a valuable tool in the toolbox, but it can't be the only thing we use. Uh, how are we going to engage a country like Pakistan, where there is no political incentive to change any of this? You know, people get elected by hating the Ahmadi Muslim community. That is a vote getter. It's a sad thing to say. It goes against the founding ideals of the country, uh, but there's a sizable majority who are more interested in, jin in jihad than Jinnah. Um, and so how do we engage the average Pakistani to accept diversity of belief, to s not be afraid of someone who thinks differently or has a uh, uh, different perspective um, but to understand that this is just reality in the 21st century, that communities, uh, belief systems are interacting as never before. But right now, the, the government, the leadership is failing that test. And not only are they failing it, they're looking to reach out and hit people in other countries, not even just uh, focusing on your community in Pakistan, but now going after Amjad. Amjad's a great guy. Why are they going after him? Uh, <laughs> And I think it just shows this, this new level of creativity uh, in being bad that is deeply troubling. And um, frankly, it's going to take a lot of effort to try to uh, create incentives for the country to go in a positive direction. Thanks so much, Knox. So I actually want to pick up on that last point that you made, because I think you know, we've all demonstrated the problem statement here. Um, things are going in the wrong direction. Uh, there's an escalation. Uh, even beyond what the government of Pakistan was doing in the past. It's following a certain blueprint that has already been played out in other countries and probably will inspire more countries to follow suit. So how do we, how do we break this cycle? How do we avoid going numb, right? Which I think is the risk, right? There is so much awfulness that is happening. This is just yet another escalation. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the technology companies, for the most part, have caved to this pressure. Uh, that is the reality that we have faced seeing both publicly and privately in those conversations that we've had with those companies. And there are various justifications that are offered uh, um, you know, for um, that type of uh, surrender. Um, so I guess the question I would pose to each of you is, what do you see, right? This is a room full of advocates who are here for a summit, um, you know, trying to change the world for the better. What do you see as the strategies, the tactics, um, the, the path forward to try to arrest this particular trend, take a stand here, um, and, and create a sense of urgency and, and righteousness um, and, and real commitment and action on part of stakeholders, you know, ranging from these governments themselves, uh, which probably is going to be the diff most difficult, but also all the way to uh, you know, the governments in the West uh, you know, who may be in a position to do something about this, to these incredibly powerful stakeholders like private businesses, you know, who are in these countries and profiting tremendously from these user bases uh, and, and who must, th you know, understand uh, the moral complexity uh, of, of, of profiting essentially from blasphemy. How do you address that? Unfortunately, uh, it's going to get a lot worse for tech companies. So the PICA amendments that we've been talking about include a provision that essentially requires uh, social media companies and other technology companies to become a vector for the Pakistani government to enforce its anti-blasphemy laws and other provisions of the Pakistani penal code. Uh, this uh, provision of the, the PICA amendments would force technology companies to respond within 24 hours to content moderation orders issued by the PTA uh, and in some emergency situations, air quotes on, respond within six hours. If the companies fail to do so, uh, they face sanction, and that sanction could involve prospectively being blocked in Pakistan. Now, social media companies are blocked in Pakistan, uh, unfortunately, all the time, right? Over the past year, we've seen um, uh, TikTok, um, Tinder, Grindr, a couple other dating apps, um, PUBG, which is a, a game that 
you play to, to shoot other people on the internet. All of those things have been blocked um, for briefly. Um, but this, uh, uh, these amendments would essentially put um, the companies uh, in, in a, uh, a place where they have to make a decision between enforcing these rights abusing orders um, or facing incredible sanction from the Pakistani government. Now, um, other governments around the world are taking a similar tack. Um, India's new IT rules um, in force, I think, in, as of March of this year, excuse me, May of this year, um, take a very, very similar approach. Um, Turkey passed a law last year that uh, puts tech companies, again, in a very tough position. So I'll say that those of us in, in the, the human rights and, and technology space will continue pushing on companies to respect human rights and their content moderation. Uh, there's a couple of ways that companies can do this. Um, there's this great document that I'm sure many of you are familiar with called the UN Guiding Principles on, on Business and Human Rights that outlines how businesses, including tech companies, can put human rights at the center of their practices. And the UNGP includes specific reference to special protection for religious minorities. Um, now, when it comes to removing online content, um, you know, companies uh, should take steps to make their processes as, as transparent and understandable as, pro as possible for users. So that means leaving opportunities for appeal, um, notifying users when a government is ordering them to take down content. Um, all of these mechanisms can make it much better when companies do have to um, enforce uh, content restrictions that um, restrict how people are able to express themselves online um, or, or represent their religious communities online. Now, um, normally in this part of, of the talk, I would talk about ways that companies should be fighting back. Um, and so there are all of these mechanisms that um, we really encourage companies to take, like seeking uh, uh, appeal in local courts, in in-country courts, when they receive orders to take down content that um, companies are concerned would involve violations of human rights. We encourage companies to go to regulators um, and, and seek uh, assistance from regulators in navigating this dynamic. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, uh, it seems like the options are, are severely limited in these opportunities for, for seeking redress and seeking appeal within these local uh, uh, judicial systems and regulatory systems. Now, um, I recognize that we were hoping to, to take this into an action item stage. And so I think um, when it comes to the tech company world, it's really, really important that all of you in the religious freedom space start and, and continue to cultivate these connections with the folks within these companies who work in human rights and who are pushing internally to preserve how companies are, are respecting human rights in all of their business decisions. Um, and and uh, this doesn't just apply to the big tech platforms. Unfortunately, when we talk about restricting content, there's a whole universe of companies that we don't even know about that are active in the space. Um, in Pakistan, a company called Sandvine um, is contracted to do quote unquote internet monitoring. Um, we don't know what that means in the Pakistani content, but um, Sandvine was used to shut down the internet in Belarus um, when uh, uh, mass human rights and pro-democracy protests mobilized last year. And so there are other companies to be, to be targeting for these advocacy opportunities, um, and again, to bring it back to those rights-respecting respect principles um, for businesses. Yeah, I think um, all of that I completely agree with. I think working as a human rights lawyer particularly trying to draw that connection right between human rights law um, and the digital space and, and all of the protections that we need, uh, the religious freedom folks have oftentimes not been the ones that are called into the room when tech companies say, hey, we want a human rights report on a country. So they're not there. And if you're not there, you're not going to be heard, right? Um, and I think that's not necessarily because they haven't, uh, you know, that they're not great or they wouldn't be great partners for this conversation. I think it's just that they haven't made that connection, right? Uh, human rights is about human connections, right? So the more connections you have, the better off it is. I think um, Amjad and myself and, and others in the MD uh, community who I've been working with, we did reach out and we've been trying to, and I think that's something for everyone in this room to be doing. The second point I'll say is something that Knox and I actually have oftentimes talked about, what's the incentive, right? How can we incentivize? And I'll go back to a Bloomberg uh, business story from three weeks ago that said that the information minister of Pakistan wants to increase Pakistan's technology sector twice over in the next two years by building tech cities, right? 
So what you have to know is that you can't do these kinds of restrictions and create this kind of parallel universe that these companies have to follow now of your own rules and then hope that they're going to invest billions of dollars in building campuses in your country, right? Um, I think it's not good for business. And I think the way that a lot of the companies see it right now, because they don't have a footprint on the ground oftentimes, they say, okay, whatever the regulator says, let's just do it. Like, it's just the path of least resistance. That's fine. But if you want to double your industry, well, now you have a chip that we can talk about, right? We can incentivize you bringing these rules and laws in place and not becoming this parallel system that you keep trying to create. You know, in Urdu, there's a phrase, it's called mita uh, mita gap gap karva karva tu tu. So like, when it's sweet, you eat it up, right? So you have access to internet, you have more companies coming in and you love it, it's great. And when it's bitter, right, when you have to check your population, when you have to check politicians who are saying we should use this digital platform to hate Amity's because it's a great way to get votes, well then it's too, too, I don't want that, of course not. And unfortunately, you can't expand your market by twofold or, or provide yourself as some kind of global center for technology while having that perspective. You're gonna have to amend some of your, uh, your policies that you've taken that are discriminatory um, and that just can't be accepted under UN guiding principles, under ICCPR, under various human rights instruments. So I think that's where we have a bit of an incentive to say to companies, hey, this country really wants to have you increase your footprint there. You need to press back on them now because it's not just about keeping the status quo. They're trying to double up. So if you're trying to double up, well then I have requests for you to be able to double up, right? Um, because these companies, I think, oftentimes often don't realize that these regulatory frameworks are going to impact their business eventually. It might not be right now, so they'll cave in, but they will eventually harm your ability to do business in a country when one post could literally cause a riot, and now the whole world community is looking at Facebook and saying, you allowed a post that literally had 100 people die because of it, right? And that's the kind of place Pakistan is. It's a, it's, it's a place where you know, that match can go into that gasoline and cause real damage. So for them to start thinking about this in exactly the way that Kiran was talking about is important, especially if Pakistan wants to create these tech hubs, these 2x, 10x type of uh, perspectives on technology in Pakistan. With the tech companies, I think the advocacy community needs to turn up the heat to name and shame them, that when they uh, go along with these repressive Orwellian, Kafka-esque rules, that they should be embarrassed about it. Th there should be a cost. Um, at the same time, in building up what war has just ended with, a lot of these platforms are used to whip up mobs to go murder people. Um, now, I'm a free speech advocate. Freedom of expression is something I think is very important, but when there's a bright line when it comes to advocating violence, and in many cases in Pakistan, the bright line is met. Like, we're not worried about uh, some limitation on speech. People are being called to go murder. Um, tech companies need to bear the responsibility for that as well. So I think there's a two-fold way to engage them. And I think we, as Americans here in the room, need to ask our government to do more to press Pakistan on the fact that they are reaching out with their oppressive law to hit American citizens. That is outrageous. That, that is outrageous. And what is our government doing to make it crystal clear to Pakistan that that is not, not the way partners work together? That is not what you do between friends. Now, I know we're kind of frenemies and we've got this complicated relationship, but you know, we are a superpower. And if a country comes out after our citizens, there needs to be a strong response. And so how are we motivating our members of Congress, our senators, Secretary Blinken, President Biden, to make it crystal clear this has to stop? President Biden's been very outspoken with Vladimir Putin on all these uh, cyber attacks on our infrastructure. That's great, that's important. We need to have the same kind of high-level response that you do not get American citizens who are acting inside the United States to share information with American citizens. That is, that, is, that is just wrong and we can't stand for that. And we need to make sure that our elected leaders hear from us so that they uh, do, what's, do what's right. Thank you so much, Knox. Well, I just, I wanted to thank, this, this is an amazing discussion, but we do have to wrap up. Um, I, I hope this is the start of a, con of a deeper conversation, actually. I wanted to thank all of the distinguished panelists. Mamou, thank you for moderating the session. To Nadine, to Sir Iftikhar Ayaz. Thank you so much for coming to this event. I, 
I want to end by, by just simply reiterating that um, the, the, the digital landscape is really altering the way religious freedom is perceived and it is creating conditions that require us to stay vigilant about those changes and then react and adapt accordingly. Um, and that was mentioned uh, by each of the panelists. And unfortunately, um, technology changes so rapidly and in places where hate speech and online content is creating such uh, unbelievable uh, strife, it's important for religious freedom advocates to understand that they need to take immediate action to redress this. And I hope that this particular conversation um, provokes further discussion by our own US government, by civil society, and other human rights organizations to deepen these conversations, and also to address them directly with the information agencies in these governments. So with that, thank you very much for coming. We hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.